So welcome everybody. Welcome to our third class with Nikki on healing anxiety and depression. Thank you, Sheila. And uh, and hello and uh, welcome to everybody. And so nice to be back again. And I really um, enjoyed preparing the class for this week because we're going to really dive in this week to um to this kind of new paradigm of Buddhist psychology uh, because today we're going to be looking at uh, desirous attachment and how attachment ruins everything which is so ironic isn't it because attachment this whole wish for things to go well to have what we want for everything to be nice and yet the more attachment we have the more inability we have to enjoy anything and the more it ruins all the good things that we have so we're going to have a look at uh, what we can do about it. What are the what what are the drivers underneath desirous attachment? How come it's got us in a in in its grip so so strongly? Uh, so some of the the kind of the misconceptions, and then what we can do about it. And there are many different approaches that we can take to overcoming desirous attachment that terrible feeling of dissatisfaction and grasping and um then a really nice meditation at the end as well so uh hopefully you've got some questions or questions will come up i don't know if any of you are uh watching the previous course uh youtube clips it's a bit of a, a mixed bag isn't it because it's great to be able to if you can watch them because it gives you a whole lot of background uh, in this Buddhist psychology and especially going through the terminology and, and that, that switch that we have to do with our mind to start looking at things from a different angle. But of course, on the, in the last course, then we ran out of time to discuss things. So this course is all about discussing things and actually trying to bring all of the theory into our everyday examples. So luckily today I woke up with a couple of everyday examples to share with you, just quite seemingly random ones, but very pertinent to this topic of attachment. So let's start with a meditation. And I wanted to start with a, a slightly different meditation to settle body and mind with the nine round breathing. So I'm not sure if you've done the nine round breathing before, but um, this is a really nice, simple way to do it. And actually uh, what I thought we could uh, do first is just to set the scene for ourselves. So before we say any prayers, let's just adjust our body so that we are feeling comfortable so we're not going to be distracted by uh, any pain or any strain in our body so making sure that your posture is relaxed and then in whatever way is comfortable just straightening your spine a little having a posture that is that you feel is alert and ready to engage in the class whichever way is going to suit you. Bringing your focus inwards. Just becoming aware of your own body in the room. And then bring to mind all the people in your life and see them all sitting around you comfortably just like you are friends and family the everyday acquaintances even the people you have problems and difficulties with we're all in the same boat so we're all here <laughs> and then in particular really focus on the love that your friends and family feel for you how they care about you how they've stuck by you 
how they seem to see qualities in you that you don't even notice. Also think of your teachers who put so much effort into you, school teachers that taught you how to read and write, our Dharma teachers, And then think of all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas that surround us all the time, but we're oblivious to it and how deeply they care about us and how they don't see our faults. They see our potential. They don't see flawed human beings. They see potential Buddhas. When they see us, that's what they see. And feel all of this appreciation and love and care manifesting as golden light just surrounding you as if you are in a great blissful energized force field of love and care so we can go for refuge recognizing that what our main refuge is is understanding cause and effect but how are we going to do that by being guided and led and protected so we can say i go for refuge until i am enlightened to the buddha the dharma and the supreme assembly by the merits i create through listening to the dharma may i become a buddha to benefit all sentient beings so really feel that with this support of our friends and family, our teachers and all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, that we have a possibility of doing this, of becoming just like the Buddhas. So keeping this feeling of the golden light surrounding you, which is the the manifestation of this infinite love that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas feel for you, as well as the love and care that everyone in our day-to-day -day life feels for us. And we'll do the nine round breathing. So actually feel that you breathe in through your right nostril, that radiant golden light, the love and kindness surrounding you. And you you breathe it in, you accept it, you accept that love and help. Breathing in through your right nostril and feel all of that, that uh, energy flood through your body. And then as you breathe out through the left nostril, release all the anxiety, the doubt, the tension, the negative mind states, the constant sniping and skepticism, just let it go. All the toxic emotions, out they go. So three long, leisurely breaths, breathing in through the right nostril and out through the left, and then just relaxing. And then when you're ready, swapping the nostrils over. Um, so again, it's just in imagination. It doesn't matter if we actually breathe through the nostril or not. The main thing is to feel that as we breathe in, we accept that love and kindness. We accept that enlightened energy and all of the qualities and the realizations uh, that comes along with it. So we deeply breathe it in. And as we do, we feel our whole body uh, becomes radiant every atom of our body becomes radiant and filled with this uh, golden light of enlightened qualities so this time it's breathing in through the left nostril and then it's as if all of that golden light pushes out the negativity so it it pushes out in the form of this black smoke uh, all of the disturbed and confused states of mind there's just nowhere for them to be in your being anymore you just breathe them out so the nostrils swapped over, three long, leisurely breaths.
And then the final three are to breathe in through both nostrils and then breathe out through both nostrils. And again, as you breathe in, you feel that you fully accept all of that uh, guidance, wisdom. You absorb all the enlightened qualities, unlimited patience, unlimited uh, joyousness, unlimited wisdom, unlimited compassion, unlimited energy. It flows through your body and you absorb it. Every atom of your body becomes radiant like its own supernova. And as you breathe out, feel that you breathe out even the very subtle negativity. So feel that the smoke, all those toxic emotions and afflictive states of mind begins to grow um, lighter, a little bit like mist, so that even the very subtle negativities, you breathe them out so they're completely gone. So through both nostrils three times. And then from this most uh, optimum state of mind, state of being, then uh, we can remember our motivation. So the big picture is that we're doing this course so we ourselves can become just like the Buddhas. So we ourselves can help all suffering sentient beings. Um, but to be able to do that, we've got a few things to do beforehand. And so to keep that in mind that we're not just doing these little day-to-day -day things, but the really the big picture and how extraordinary it is and how possible it is. So having the courage of our convictions, we can um, bring our focus back to the room and dive into this most excellent of topics <laughs> of uh, how to get rid of desirous attachment because we are in the desire realm. So what, what does that mean? It means that uh, our main most obvious driver of everything of the machinery of samsara is attachment and uh attachment is it's so ironic in that it ruins our sense of joyousness it ruins our satisfaction it ruins our relationships it ruins even the fleeting happiness that we have of this world so uh, how to actually deconstruct attachment is a really, really big endeavor. So I thought we could start with, with the definition of attachment because <laughs> I've got my most wanted poster, which you'd be familiar with from the, from the last course. So Angelina attachment. So attachment, desirous attachment, how do we know when it first arises, it's because we call it anticipation. So right at the beginning of it, it's anticipation. It feels good. Um, often the best part of getting something is the anticipation. <laughs> and when we actually get the thing, we're disappointed. So this is the tricky thing about attachment, that at first it feels good. It looks good. It appears good. It feels pleasant. And because of that, we get sucked in. So the appearances are deceptive right from the beginning, and that's why it's so difficult. So what does attachment do? First, it exaggerates all the good characteristics of something. So conventionally, things have good and bad characteristics. They're pleasant, unpleasant. So what attachment does is it sees what is conventionally pleasant to our eye through a whole combination of circumstances and karma and it exaggerates it makes it bigger than what it is it also projects qualities and attributes onto the object that are not there and 
then it's biased and it and it sees only the good qualities and none of the drawbacks. So you can see there is this tiny skerrick of uh, realism in there, but it just distorts like a funhouse mirror. So I, I was trying to think of um, <clears throat> examples about this and I thought I'd go back to last week's example about when I was in my 20s and I was making costumes and couture and uh, spent a lot of time on my appearance and I can remember being at various parties and things and looking around and seeing, oh my gosh, I'm the best looking woman here and the result uh everybody else feeling inadequate <laughs> so there were so many things wrong with this so one I couldn't figure out well how come I've been striving to look good and um and now I do and it's not bringing anybody joy and I noticed oh I actually don't want to make people feel bad I want to make people feel good and so what's happening here and the main thing that I started thinking about was that just because you're the best looking person in the room, it doesn't mean you're the best person. It just, it's just your looks. And actually in the scheme of things, looks count for very little, <laughs> but they predominant, predominate in our awareness because our senses are continuously being drawn outwards and we are mostly dominated by our sense of sight. That's the that is the prevailing one out of out of all of our senses. That is the dominant one, and so we have a distorted uh, experience of the world just through that. To the extent that we think how someone looks is how they are. So here we go: the exaggeration, exaggerating the good characteristics. That if you look good, then somehow you're a you're a better person. <laughs> There's an assumption in there, isn't it? completely wrong so I wasn't the best conversationalist in the room I wasn't the most polite in the room uh, I'm certainly wasn't the best cook in the room uh, all of that I'm not the best driver in the room probably not the best person to live with not the, didn't look after my pets as well as anybody else did <laughs> like all of these things that I wasn't, all I was, was how I looked. And so when we are focused on just how we look, we start thinking that's all there is and that means something. But doesn't, it's an exaggeration. So the second thing that we project then when we see someone looking good, um, we project qualities that aren't there. So because someone looks good, we think they are good or we're attracted to them. Because someone has charisma, we're attracted to them. But there's actually no reason underneath that. And so often uh, when people look good, we have all these assumptions that they are a good person, <laughs> that they're, they're kind and polite and they wouldn't cheat on us and all of these things. We don't know we have those assumptions. They're just there. But, um, you know, one of the things, of course, whenever a supermodel is rude on a plane or at a show, it makes the news, doesn't it? And, and why does it make the news? <laughs> because there's this discrepancy in our mind that we think, oh, a supermodel looks good, is good. And so then when they're rude, it's cognitive dissonance. We're like, how can that be? It's also why a lot of scammers get away with it, because when you present uh, as if you are well-bred and well-dressed and you have good teeth and good deportment and you're groomed, everybody thinks you're a good, legitimate, moral human being. And so the best scam artists dress up like that. And so people go, yeah, but they were a nice, they were a nice guy and they're wearing a suit and I thought they were legit. <laughs> and it's just the appearance. So we project qualities onto the appearance that are not there and it trips us up all the time so in Australia we have this great ad at the moment for insurance where they just show someone standing there and they're just standing there looking at the screen not doing anything and they're asking you um 
you know, who do you think this person is? What do you think that they do? And it might be someone with all scruffy hair and wearing some some beads and maybe some sandals. And then it says, oh, CEO of a company, father of two deaf children, you know, doesn't need this insurance, needs that insurance. And so it just blows your perceptions and your, your assumptions. And it's, I mean, it's in a way I'm a bit shamed because I have all those assumptions straight away. But it's a brilliant ad because that's what we do all the time. We read a book by its cover. So that's just what happens. What we've got to do is take it with a pinch of salt. So the appearances are going to be there. And even bodhisattvas, they see the same thing as us. They see the, the, you know, the appearances just like we do. But the difference between an Arya bodhisattva and us is that they don't believe the appearance. So there is hope for us. We don't have to get rid of the appearance. We just have to start having the habit of not believing the appearance. So as a costume, costume, uh, uh, that's what I started playing around with of my appearance. So I might have said in one of the previous classes that how my appearance is like my exam to you. <laughs> because it's like what assumptions do you have of a lady with bright pink hair or clothes or whatever and I remember it um in one of the Bendigo retreats not only did I have the bright pink hair and clothes but I was crocheting a, a rug for Rinpoche we had crochet for Rinpoche so for the whole time in the discussions and um throughout the puja I could crochet and do the puja at the same time so everyone just knew me as the crochet lady <laughs> which was great. I got to fly under the radar. Um, and so no one knew that I was the SPC, the spiritual program coordinator. No one knew I led classes. They just thought I was like a crazy cat lady. <laughs> so I had a real holiday. It was fantastic. Anyway, so the projections, it's its right there. Um and and with my hair, I'm kind of like I see if anybody, how people respond to my hair, then I can figure out how many assumptions people have or not. So it's just like a like a little game. Um, and it helps me get a read on people as well of, of how I probably should act a little bit more serious if I want to get my point across sometimes. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is biased. So. Um, we see only the good qualities. And when we see only the good characteristics in somebody, we start believing that's all they are. And so when one little flaw appears, it's devastating to us. It's also um, just the mind of attachment like that of just seeing the good qualities. It's how we dive into whatever it is, a relationship into wanting something, into collecting stuff. And of course, because we're just seeing the good qualities, then we want it and we have the grasping of it. But if we actually saw any of the drawbacks, our grasping would naturally dissolve. So just before we go to the questions, I thought I'd tell you this little story about this uh, show that I watched about uh, people getting Botox and uh, trying to look younger. So right there, it's fraught, isn't it? This assumption that if you look younger, you're better. So it's the cult of youth and how, our, of course, perpetuated by our culture of um, youth rather than wisdom <laughs> being the operative thing. And so this experiment that they did was they got about 12 people and they stuck them in front of a, of a computer and they flashed all of these faces, people, you know, with, with different expressions. And they were recording on this computer program how long it took for the person to recognise what the expression was. And so, you know, people, all the different expressions flashing up and you'd, you'd put in the multiple choice what the emotion was. And part of the experiment was to record how when we look at faces, we mirror the face of the person that we're looking at. So if someone's smiling, we mirror smiling. If someone's being angry, we start mirroring anger. We reflect it back. So it's this whole study about mirror neurons. 
And uh, and if someone's crying, then we kind of mirror that as well. If someone's perplexed, we mirror that to the extent that uh, when we when we welcome people, when we recognize somebody uh, instinctually, you, it's automatically your eyebrows flip up just a little bit. And the other person's eyebrows flip up as well in recognition. And it's a it's an automatic response. You can't actually stop doing it. <laughs> so so they tested everybody what their response time was for being able to recognize expressions and the amount of uh, empathy or care that they had towards the person. And then everybody went off and got Botox or the injectables. So the injectables are mostly about to take the wrinkles off near your mouth and your frown lines. So it affects your smile and it affects your eyebrows. So that uh, even if you smile or you frown and nothing happens on your face, <laughs> Everybody's so happy. They get their, their, their Botox. They look 10 years younger. They're feeling fantastic. You know, we think it's going to be the answer to our problems. We'll look better. We'll feel better. Everybody will like us more. We'll have better relationships. We'll make more money. All of these assumptions and projections. And then they did the experiment again of flashing up the face, people's faces and how long it took to recognize what the emotion was. And it was like way, way, way down. It's like 40% less. And the reason was because when they were looking at the face, their own face couldn't mirror it, couldn't mirror sadness, couldn't mirror anger, couldn't mirror happiness. And because our face couldn't do that, then the message to our brain didn't get there. And so the people were feeling less empathy, less emotion, and less connectivity. So isn't that ironic? Here we are with uh, this wish to be an, a better looking person. Why? So we have better relationships. People like us, we'll feel happier, more satisfied, all of those things. And because we have immobilized our face, we can't mirror back. And because we can't mirror back, we can't feel empathy. And then we feel disconnected. And so then you go out into the world and now you look better and you feel worse. I mean, this is the modern day horror story of attachment <laughs> right there. Uh, so... Questions, comments, have you have you heard about this? You know, the, the whole thing about being able to feel empathy is by being able to actually mirror it back? No. <laughs> I hope this has put you all off having any form of Botox, like just, hey, kids, don't do it. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's not worth ruining our own ability to experience emotion and empathy. <laughs> Uh, questions, comments, how are we going? Who's got one? Anybody? There's got to be something. Yeah, Wiley, go for it. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say um, that it, it's just so funny how noticing when you start studying the stuff and you start noticing the attachment you know and I because I remember when I first started this is a silly example but I um a few years ago I was going on a vacation and I knew that I was I there was a set specific series of books that I wanted and I knew it was attachment and I could have just gotten them on my kindle but I was like I was determined to have all of the books in physical form and I got a few from one library and then I got a few from a bookstore and then I got a few, and then I was like I'm determined I'm going to get these and I went all over Manhattan trying to get them and I could tell that it was attachment in my head but I was still doing it but I was laughing at myself and I so I guess it was better that I at least knew that it was attachment than if I had just been driven by it 
Oh, look, I'm so glad you brought this one up because I don't think it's a silly example. At all. I think this is this is one that we all really suffer from, especially <laughs> as Buddhists. This is our this is our like our, our personal kind of uh again, it's like a like a spiritual exam, isn't it? Our attachment to books. <laughs> so it's um yeah, again, so when we look at the definition of attachment, so the projection, um, the exaggeration and the bias. So we should be able to determine uh, what is attachment as in distorted attachment and what actually is going to be useful. So probably uh, if we read the book, <laughs> then we can't underestimate the value of the book because it's dharma and dharma technically you can't be attached to because you can't exaggerate its benefit but that's in the reading of the book not in the having of the book and what can happen to us especially in an affluent culture is that it's we just collect the books i mean i've done exactly the same thing collect the books but that's like collecting a whole lot of prescriptions and never going and getting them filled never actually internalizing them just having your really nice, perfect set of prescriptions ready to go, and we don't get better. Uh, but, of course, the first step is to get the prescription. <laughs> so first step, then we've got to remember the bigger picture. So the shortcut for that is to remember who's it for, what's it for. So this isn't just for me. My life isn't just mine. It's for others. And so then, yeah, you can have the joy of collecting the set. But if you're doing it for others, if you remember what it's for, you'll actually get some satisfaction from that and you'll use it. <laughs> so it's like the life hack is who's it for? It's for others. My life is for others. And um, and that just cuts through everything. Uh, last week when we were talking about attachment and uh you know we we have attachment to stuff and i have incredible attachment to stuff i'm pretty much a natural born hoarder and then my occupation before being at a buddha center of being a dressmaker of sewing it's you you have to be a hoarder because you have to have all of that stuff on hand so that didn't help <laughs> or maybe it helped in a weird kind of way and I've been watching a lot of those shows on hoarders and read some very interesting books about hoarding. And so one of the main things that stands out to me about this is that when you have whatever object it is, whatever object your mind alights on, you see the possibilities in it. And a hoarder will see the possibilities in even rubbish in stuff that other people don't see the possibilities in. And so each time you look at those things and someone goes, that's just rubbish, I'll chuck it out. Everything in you goes, no. So I remember seeing one really incredibly sad show of this lady who her whole house was just full of rubbish and they picked up this shopping bag, you know, they got the professional organisers in and it was just dripping with rotten stuff from the kitchen and it was this pumpkin that had basically just rotted away and caramelized and turned into mush and she's like no no I can use those pumpkin seeds and she's so distressed and actually when we look at this from a Buddhist point of view there is possibility in everything that's true that's you can't deny that and so a hoarder sees the possibility in everything. And then, of course, there's all the layers of sometimes you've suffered a great loss. So then trying to, to save the, the broken things from society that everyone else chucks out and you have a real feel for it that you want to save them. But the big, big mistake that happens is that we think the possibility is in the thing. We think the possibility is in the pumpkin seeds or in the broken doll or in the book or in the shoes. But the possibility is in our mind. The possibility is our attitude. 
but grasping an inherent existence this is one of the one of the examples of it it's when we think the possibility lies in the thing and therefore we can't let go of the thing so B. Allen Wallace, uh, when someone asked him, you know, what what's the main thing about Buddhism? If you're going to say to someone, what is it that stood out to you about Buddhism in one sentence, what is it? And B. Allen Wallace said, the emotions or the feelings are not in the things. <laughs> They're not in the things. They're in us. But see, grasping at appearances, we forget because the appearances is there we get the this feeling of possibility and all of the potential and all of the wonderful things about it and then we believe that appearance is true that it comes from the thing and then we want the thing so then grasping kicks in and so then we 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 spend a whole lot of time trying to get the thing and so if we make progress, that's called anticipation and it's kind of enjoyable because <laughs> we're looking forward to it. And then we get the thing. And of course, because the emotion, the feeling is not in the thing, we get the thing, it doesn't work. You get the, you get the book and it's like, oh, oh yeah, whatever. Now I want the next one. <laughs> It's a tragic comedy, isn't it? There was another story with the hoarders where one lady she couldn't let rid of get rid of her husband. Her husband had died quite a few years ago. She couldn't get rid of any of his clothes and uh, none of his stuff, and it was filling up the whole house. And so the professional organizer was in there, and they managed to get rid of just about everything except for this old cruddy pair of trousers. And she just didn't, she was just crying and crying and her whole family's totally impatient, sick of it all. And the organiser actually had some insight to share, which was that your, your memory of your husband is not in the trousers. Your memory is in you. There's, there's other ways that you can have that memory. And not only that, but your memory of your husband isn't reducible to one pair of trousers. It's much bigger than that. And it's this fear of losing the memory or that feeling of the husband that makes you hold on to the stuff. But once we realize it's not in the stuff, then, we're, then we can be released. Then there are other ways of telling the story. So is it ring any bells for anybody? <laughs> yeah, Abelardo, go for it. Well, uh, first of all, I, I had a learning uh, from my father. My father, uh, he was relatively poor as, as a young person. Uh, so uh, that led, when he was an adult, to a habit of uh, anything he found on the sidewalk, like a screw or, or a, a bolt or anything like that, he had separate jars and, or, or, or you know, a, a coin of certain, each jar was for one thing, you know, the same kind of thing. and. Uh, uh, so uh, that's how I grew up. And then he, he hoarded books. So uh, he, I, I developed the two compulsions in my life. One, books also. And, and then uh, at one period of time, uh, recordings and records. And then I would record video uh, videos uh, of programs on the TV. And I had my whole family even involved in helping me record. <laughs> and it was awful. I, I was stressing everybody, myself, you know. Was, yeah. Anyway, that, that was a while ago. I'm free from all that, except the books. Yeah, so the, the books is where we make our big compromise, isn't it? But how did you free yourself from it, Abelardo? How did you how did you release, you know, all the recordings or the the newspapers? Oh, I had to leave I had to leave that house, uh, you know, the separation, divorce and all that. Uh, and I live in an apartment now. And uh, so here I don't have space and I don't have that kind of compulsion anymore. So was it because uh, you didn't have them in your sight, like physically you couldn't see them anymore because or you yeah. couldn't, yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's part of it too, that it's a lot to do with our environment 
And so if we are surrounded by stuff or if we do go to the shops, naturally we're going to want the stuff in the shops because we're exposed to it. So that's the whole point of renunciation is to, um, to, to cut down on our exposure because wherever our sight is drawn, the process is going to kick in of attachment because we have attachment working within us. It doesn't matter what we what our sight alights on. It happens enough, we're going to want it <laughs> if we don't deal with the attachment. So part of it is to give ourselves this window of opportunity of space. So downsizing, having to go to another apartment and actually not have the stuff in front of you gives you a break. Not going shopping gives you a break. Um, but it doesn't solve the problem. So the the... It, but it kind of slows things down enough that we can begin to deal with it. And right. again, like with books, we've got to remember what they're for. So just the other day I went and um, read, redid my will. And so I have a bit of a, a, a book collection compulsion. But what makes me happy is I've left my books to various things. So I've left, you know, Dharma books to Lungry Tonka Centre. I've left the art books to my alternative school that I went to when I was young and all my sewing machines and, and, and incredible brocades to the alternative school up here. And so that's actually what makes me happy is this thought of sharing. And that makes me happier than the shorter, than the thought of collecting. And so then, you know, of course you collect and then and then the cockroaches get in behind the books and it's like, how many times have I read this book? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Uh, Wiley? I didn't mean to bring this all to, to books, but I was just going to say one more thing that has helped with, with me too, is I work in publishing, so I have a lot of books. And um, one thing that I've started doing is when I do start collecting books that are unread, and this they're not all Dharma books, a lot of them are fiction and stuff like that, is I'll play, am I really going to read this right now? And then sort through it. And then I give them away to people. And that feels good because I think of it as finding a new home. So, and then I also, then I don't beat myself up on wasting money because it's like, okay, it may be a book someone else could really, really need, you yeah. know, you find it. So I take it to those little library things that people have on the street and so that yes, was really yeah the street fun. libraries and so that's it so you have a new way of operating with the thing and and how it works is by remembering what's it for what can I do with this what's another way to tell the story so how I used to do with clothes was uh I was making clothes I was really good at op shopping totally obsessed with clothes but all my girlfriends and boyfriends had come over and we'd play dress ups before going out. And so everybody would just raid my closet and, and wear all of my clothes and we'd spend a couple of hours getting it right and then go out for the couple of hours, maybe even less. But part of it was almost like a, a psycho play of actually developing our identity, how, who we are, how we want to be in the world, how we want to communicate with others what are the themes in my life so that sharing just through clothes i mean what do clothes mean they um, it's uh, i've often been very embarrassed that what i do is make clothes because in the scheme of things it's certainly not curing malaria or anything but in that in what you can do with it then it was profound so that was the that was the best fun that i've had with clothes was the dress ups <laughs> same kind of thing so seeing what's another way that we can tell this story and um one of my relatives is also a hoarder and she's 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 a very clean hoarder she says i wash all the things and then i store them so she saves things and mends them and so what her way through this now has been to to repair and then to give to charity rather than to repair and to keep so we can put in, we can still work with our own themes, but we put in a, a new story. So all of this, how come this all operates like this is to do oh, with what comes from the Four Noble Truths, which are the misconceptions about the nature of things. And when we have the misconceptions, we have suffering. So the degree of suffering that we experience is directly proportionate to the degree of attachment. So if we suffer, 
it's because we have attachment. If we suffer greatly, <laughs> it's because we have a huge amount of attachment. And so this um, doesn't mean that we have to get rid of things, but we just got to change our attitude. So the misconceptions, things, people, relationships don't change. So when we hoard things, and especially with books, we think we'll have them forever. But the books get moldy. They get eaten by the little insect thingies, uh, book fish, whatever they are, <laughs> fire fish, something fish, um, and cockroaches. Then if you get flooded or if your house burns down, then if you have to move, oh, my God, they're so heavy and the boxes are just... <laughs> They just keep on going like a freight train all night. So when, we, when we're holding them and then years go by and we haven't read them and not only that, nobody else has read them either. So we've been depriving people. So I look at the things that I've been hoarding and I happened, this happened with clothes too for, you know, for 10 years and then now it's kind of rotted or the leather's gone hard or something like that. And I'm thinking someone could have been enjoying this for 10 years, but I, was, I had it instead. So it's, I'm kind of ashamed about that. And it comes from expecting things to stay exactly how they are, but they're not going to be. They're limited. So what's the best use that we can get out of them? Then we have this assumption that things and people and relationships will bring lasting happiness will bring us that inner peace happiness and content but actually no matter how much we acquire we're still dissatisfied and we'll get bored even if we get the perfect thing we'll eventually get sick of it we'll want to change it's why people keep remodeling their kitchen like who needs to <laughs> nobody and yet it's booming or we get a bit bored and we go, oh, I think I'll go and, you know, do some shopping as entertainment, as a thing to do. So uh, the wish for happiness, that's not what we give up. What we give up is looking for it in the wrong place. So the happiness is not in the book. <laughs> the happiness even is not in 10 books. The book can give us a temporary happiness, yes. But the happiness is in us. So we have to grow it within us. So this, the big thing from that I got from this at least is that it's not that you have to just go all bland and give up your passions and your, you know, passion for life, your lust for life. You don't have to give any of that up. You just got to look for it in the right place. So growing up a, <laughs> I've got to say this, you know, growing up a Buddhist in a way, um, it just ruined me for parties. Because when I was a kid, I got to go to all the pujas with Lama Yeshi and Lama Zoprimbache and it was at Chenrezig Institute and I was, got to stay up really late at night and it was dark. It was even before they had electricity. So there's candles and it was just so atmospheric and then all this chanting and then the the drums, the cymbals, the conch shells, Lama Zoprimbache's insane little tape deck thing where he turned on the 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 sound of the the dakini trumpets and the the tape decks gone all kind of skew if so it just sounds like alien music like the whole thing was fantastic and i just loved it <laughs> and then when i grew up and started going to nightclubs i'm like oh man this is nothing like where are the drums <laughs> where's the excitement where's the drama Where's the sustain? Like, just wasn't even there. So I spent a good couple of decades trying to find that music and that experience again. So, uh, and now I've come full circle. And so now we have, at Library Thomas Centre, we have epic Guru Pooja's every now and again. When Guru Pooja falls on a Saturday night, we have Guru Pooja with the lot. 
and it's about three and a half to four hours. We do every single tune in the long version with all the drums and cymbals, and it's just like mind altering. <laughs> and that's my ultimate party. That's really what does it. So I I never gave up on that wish to be moved and transported, but I did find that it it wasn't it wasn't out there. It wasn't in the nightclub. And it wasn't even in the music. It's in the process. It's in what happens in your mind. And of course, in a puja, everything's set up for that transformation in your mind. <laughs> anyway, slight little uh, detour there. Uh, so when we wish for things to bring us lasting happiness, it's again, it's not the thing that brings us the lasting happiness. But it doesn't mean that we give up on lasting happiness. Lasting happiness is possible. This is our whole point in life, isn't it? We've got to look in a different place. Then we have this assumption that things are pure and perfect, that relationships are good, <laughs> that equipment should work, that uh, hospitals uh, and, and doctors and nurses should know their stuff. Uh, we know we have this assumption whenever we say, oh, it shouldn't have happened. That's not, this is unacceptable. So again, we have this expectation that people are perfect, that, that equipment is perfect when it's not and it never can be. By nature, it can't be. So one of the, one of the, the ways that we can describe samsara is by remembering samsara is when things are not quite right. <laughs> not quite right. So it's okay. At a, on a good day, it's okay, but it's not quite right. And that's as good as it gets in samsara. That's as good as it gets. And so if we change our attitude for this and we go, okay, so it's good enough. I think there was a whole movement of being a good enough mother, a good enough parent. It takes the pressure off. If something works relatively well for most of the time, it's good enough and pretty much that's as good as it gets. And so then we've switched our expectations around that now the whole time that it's working, we're happy. And then when it doesn't work, we go, oh, course rather than expecting everything to be perfect and being constantly disappointed and the last one we think that things have a real findable essence but actually including ourselves we think there's a real me but actually when we look at who this real me is we're just this collection of reactions to circumstances we're just reactivity embodied we're a product of our era. We're a product of our education. We're a, a product of our gender, of the politics that we grew up with or reacted against, of our religion, the one that we ditched, the one that we, we took on. If we took all of those elements away, who are we? <laughs> it's just circumstantial, isn't it? So, again, when we think about books and hoarding, we think that, that it's in the book. We think that the book has this real findable essence. All those rotting pumpkin seeds could become a pumpkin. We think it's right there in the thing. That's that real grasping at inherent existence. And it's that grasping that causes us the pain. because. Actually, if we saw possibility in everything, why isn't that bringing us joy? <laughs> so why is not bringing us joy? And then, and then we decide what we're going to spend our time and energy on. What's bringing the pain is the grasping. Not seeing the possibility, but the grasping. That real deep attachment not just grasping at wanting to collect things, but grasping at inherence, grasping at in, as if something is inherently true. And that grasping is what constricts us and brings the pain. 
So we can work it back and go, the amount of pain that we feel comes from the amount of grasping that we have. And if we let go of the grasping, then we can enjoy everything. <laughs> then we can be like Lama Yeshi and enjoy everything. Comments, questions? <laughs> yeah, Wally, go for it. So is, is the way to think about it then when it is something that you want to do or that you're attached to is thinking, okay, I realize this is going to bring me temporary pleasure. It's not going to be permanent happiness and just recognize everything like that when you're going into a situation that you may be trying to break attachment with rather than yes. just like code, code, just code getting rid of it or something like that. That's part of it, but I think we can, we can do more. So if we ask, um, so one, recognizing that it's just going to bring temporary happiness, uh, that's more on the renunciation side. So we stop the grasping. So that's more on um, kind of lessening the, the grasping, the attachment. And so, the, for instance, the whole Pali tradition is, is focused on that, on just dealing with attachment, basically. But from the from the Sanskrit tradition, the main thing is on dealing with ignorance. And so what we can do then is whatever we have, we ask, what is it for? What's its function? And what's the best function that we can bring to this? And that's always to do with sharing, <laughs> with contributing, with giving to the world rather than getting. And the moment we do that, even shopping, you know, can it's we can transform it. So we can ask ourselves over and over, who's it for, what's it for, and then adjust our motivation so it becomes altruistic. And uh, I would say, actually, even, uh, where did I put this in my notes? From, from a tantric perspective, even then, not only do you use it to, you know, for others in this altruistic way, but you can use everything. You can use whether conventionally it's pretty or not, pleasant or not, you can use everything, including all the pleasant experiences. They don't have to be something that are like guilty pleasures. <laughs> So it's a it's a it's like a spectrum of approaches that we can have. And I think we need all of them. We definitely have to start with the renunciation and letting go of that grasping. And then we can start using the natural momentum of it. Okay, so then I've got a couple of other things. So here we go. Following attachment, the actual grasping, it's like drinking salt water. <laughs> so the actual desire, desire is not happiness. The anticipation is not happiness. Anticipation is kind of uh, while we're moving towards it, it feels happy. But if we don't get the thing, in, in the end, we can't bear it. We just go, well, I don't want it anyway. <laughs> but even getting the thing, it's not the happiness. Not only that, but attachment travels with us like a constant thirst. So we have this thirst and we think the thing out there will slake our thirst. Just like if we're there, we're on the sea of samsara in our little rowboat of our life, of our spiritual life, and we're so thirsty and there's water all around us. And we just think, oh my God, I just want a drink of water. So we just have one drink. Oh my gosh. And for a second, it's great, it's cool, and it's liquid, and it's wonderful. And next thing, we're doubly thirsty. And anybody who's ever had a disposable income knows this. <laughs> That's why it goes, because it's like drinking salt water. The more we follow craving, the more dissatisfied we are. So 
So if you if you do have a disposable income, you might just think, oh, well, I just need more. So then I can dispose of it more and try more things. But if you look at any of the life stories of the millionaires and the billionaires, uh, the Wolf of Wall Street is brilliant for this, that movie. I mean, it's fantastic because Leonardo DiCaprio, I mean, he plays this person with such a lust for life. I mean, if that lust for life was had the wisdom of the Dharma behind it, he'd be dynamite. But what was he? A materialist. Nothing. He couldn't use his lust for life, his courage, his thirst. He couldn't use it. He just got more and more and more and more and more dissatisfied. It's definitely worth seeing that movie because if you think, wow, if you had approached all of this without the worldly con concerns, without the distractions of thinking the experiences out there, but you just had that momentum and courage, what you could do in the world would be fantastic. So the difference between, say, attachment and, say, love or care, attachment feels pleasant at first. And then later, it's a time delay, it reveals its true nature, just like drinking salt water. And love turns to hate when attachment doesn't get what it wants. So when we think we love someone, but we don't get our expectations fulfilled, then notice how you feel about them. And if it flips over and now you don't like them anymore, or even you resent them or hate them, then you know that wasn't love. There wasn't any love there. It was just attachment. What's left at the end of the relationship when you don't like each other anymore, but you still care about them, that bit's love. <laughs> so another way that we can say this is what attachment is not. So again, the object isn't the problem. It's our craving for it. It's our grasping. The books are not the problem. It's our distorted relationship with the books that's a problem and this we can change and again with the relationships relationships of course they're not going to be perfect if we're not perfect but they can be good enough and they can help us in our endeavor in fact we can help each other on the path to enlightenment so the problem is the craving for complete fulfillment from our partner <laughs> instead of or our children or whatever instead of having our craving for complete fulfillment as our deity practice as our practice of Shakyamuni Buddha meditation so that one you can't overestimate that one you'll actually get the results that you want and of course we confuse love with genuine affection we get them mixed up all the time which is such a tragedy because of course there's 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 love and care there it's just that it's it's poisoned with our distorted emotions and it's so difficult to untangle afterwards also not all desires bring suffering it's distorted desires that bring suffering so this is especially from the, the Mahayana, not just Sutra tradition, but the Mahayana Tantra tradition, that if you have a desire to help others or a desire to, be, to become enlightened for the benefit of all or a desire to make music to, to bring joy to others, um, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. If we have a desire to share, if we support it with wisdom, it's a good thing. What makes desire negative is the distortion, is our attitude. So what I've tried to do with, you know, with dressmaking and sewing and having pink hair or whatever, so I have a desire to communicate in that way. But what I try and do is support it with wisdom. So support it with this not, not, not believing the story appearances tell me, uh, to, to remember that appearances are deceptive, to play with appearances, to encourage everybody else with their with their appearances and then help them kind of blossom into that so if it's supported with wisdom the grasping isn't so bad so when i was making costumes for people 
it was this incredible process of trying to bring out their very best in whatever character it was that they were playing. And, um, and people are really scared of their own potential. They're scared of owning it, of being fantastic. <laughs> That's the bit, you know, they're scared of what if they, if they do actually be their very best self. So my whole thing was to try and encourage people to, to, to step into all of their imaginings of who they could be. So I got incredible joy out of that. And so in terms of desire, because it was to do with sharing and communicating and giving back to society and making the world a better place, and because it was supported by wisdom that there is no real inherent self in here, therefore we can be whatever we set our mind to, then there's potential in there. So not all desires are bad. Uh, and the last point here. So with realism, the result is happiness. So realism isn't bland. Realism is happiness making. <laughs> and that's why his holiness, the Dalai Lama, despite the things that have happened in his life, how naturally joyous he is. And we think of any of our lamas, you know, that they've many of them have had incredibly difficult childhoods. But they're not bitter and twisted. They they emanate this delight in life. So what's their secret? <laughs> Realism. Okay, so we've covered some of the remedies for attachment. Remembering impermanence. Of course, remembering death is a big one, but remembering impermanence, how things change. Recognizing the impurities of the body, but also the impurities, you know, things will naturally break and deteriorate. Uh, so this is one of, um, I think we covered this in, in one of the previous courses of if we start sexually objectifying somebody, uh, we just, you just start thinking about what's under the skin <laughs> and very quickly you'll get more realistic about it. The fact that we are repulsed by what's under the skin is also a distortion, though, because actually what's under the skin is fantastic because all of that keeps us alive. Why do we see it as, as re revolting when it's so essential? Why do we see it as revolting is because the undue importance that we've put on the surface appearances so this this again is a little bit like taking your own spiritual temperature when you go oh i like the outside but i don't like the inside of the body and if there's a discrepancy there you know you've got that fever <laughs> but once you start looking at what's going on inside the body and going oh, how amazing to have this human body that by and large works by itself. You just got to put food in. You don't have to concentrate on digesting or anything like it does its thing. How fantastic. The moment you start recognizing how fantastic, then the distortion of attachments is lessened. Viewing others as one's family or viewing others with affection and forgiveness and respect. So viewing others as what can you contribute to them how can you help them what you can you share with them rather than viewing what can i get off them what can they do for me so that's you know the sharing thing meditating on emptiness so kristen you were talking about this right at the beginning of the class of um how this is such a wonderful shortcut to to give us relief isn't it relief from from that grasping so so give me an example. What how what what's something that you do that with? Well, if I just get um anxious, like I'm I've always been a really anxious person. I always have like butterflies in my stomach, always 
worried about something that may happen, you know, that whole thing. So even, you know, I just wake up in the morning at like four in the morning and I'm like, oh my God, I have this, that, and this, and all these things I have to do. And this is a problem and this is horrible. And so now, I mean, I spent my whole life like that, but now, I mean, even after the last class with you, I just bring to mind that everything, the emptiness of everything, myself, other people, and even like phenomena, you know, things, everything. And I just, it just soothes me completely. It's like, oh, well, then what does all this matter? Why am I worrying? What is the point of worrying? You know, there is no point to worrying. And it just goes right down. I just go deep down into that and just all of a sudden everything falls away. All the stress, all the anxiety. I mean, this is like a magical thing because <laughs> my, my whole entire life, I, as a little kid, I, my shoulders were like this when I was in school. Yeah. I was so anxious. And this is just the magical thing that I finally discovered. And I just go right to that. And I'm yeah. just like, Whoosh. yeah. You know. So that's how, that's how, I mean, wisdom supports our whole existence like that. So, you know, the, there's the two sides. There's the, you can go straight to the emptiness or you can go to the dependent arising, but either way we get the result. So the emptiness that there is no real me to be anxious. There is no real thing to be anxious about. There is no real anxiety. I mean, even when we look at, uh, you know, and we'll talk about this more next week, n neurologically and physiologically, anticipation and anxiety manifest in exactly the same way. Physiologically, there is no difference between anticipation and anxiety. <laughs> so what's different here is the attitude so anticipation, it's agitated, it's thinking about the future, but it's with this positive mind. And anxiety, it's agitated, it's thinking about this future with a negative mind. Mm -hmm. So then you go, well, where is the anxiety? Where is the anticipation? <laughs> How do they exist anyway? It all depends. So um through that analysis, when when we get good at it, and the first step is to just have that pinch of salt to go, hang on a second, it's not how it appears. And then the whole thing, you know, then we're off in the right direction, aren't we? So yeah, one of the, so meditating on emptiness or, or meditating on the dependent arising, meaning, you know, all the context, contextual changes, the circumstances, the neurological um, you know is it this way or th that way and then the the conclusion is ah oh, therefore it's empty of any real real existence it's empty of being true so meditating on emptiness the object doesn't exist in the way it appears how you think a lady with pink hair is <laughs> and how they are not the same thing <laughs> it all depends it all depends on the viewer then this leads to one of the main remedies for attachment is conviction in reality. Or another word is faith uh, of this real deep confidence that we can do it, that we can achieve happiness and we know how to do it and we understand how. And this keeps us going. So it's not just vague hope. It comes from almost like a scientific approach of understanding. Once you understand how to add or subtract numbers, you can't un-understand that. <laughs> you just know. And, and someone could say, oh, you don't know how to do that. doesn't matter what they say. You know you can do it. So this conviction and reality is another way of saying faith from a Buddhist point of view. That we, that we know what to do and we remember to do it uh, when the rubber hits the road. 
And of course, the last thing, the remedy for attachment is cultivating love, care, loving kindness or kindness. <laughs> so love from our kind of uh, love from a Buddhist point of view is wanting the other person to be happy. Being in love is wanting the other person. Big difference, isn't it? And many times they're all mixed up together. So we want them to be happy, but we want them as well. We want to possess them and have them and hold on to them and have them not change. All of that in love, possessing, wanting to hold on to them, that's what brings the suffering. Any joy that we have in our relationships, our friendships, our relationships with our parents, our sexual relationships, relationships with kids, even relationships, how we get on with our cats and our dogs, any joy that comes from that comes from love, from caring, from our own virtue. Any unhappiness comes from the distortion, comes from craving and an attachment. so i think we should do our little meditation now so this is a meditation on giving things away <laughs> and uh so this is it's a good thing to get practiced at and i did read once so when i was going through sorting my clothes out, what I'm going to give to the op shop and whatever. And I'd made some really nice things and they were kind of artistic clothes. And then, and then I was like, Oh no, I, perhaps I want to keep that. And I, and I'd read that if you, if you go in your mind to think, to give something away, and then you decide, no, I'm going to keep it. That that's a cause for rebirth in the lower realms and particularly a cause for rebirth as a hungry ghost. And I just thought, oh, oh, <laughs> no. So now I've been really trying to work at it. And it's a, it's a slow, slow process. So there's some things I've made. I'm quite attached to them. And then I've heard oh, it's better to give them away now than, you know, leave them in your will. Be, start giving things away now, bit by bit. So I slowly, slowly go through the whole process. And I'm also aware that if I change my mind and go, no, no, I want to keep it, that miserliness, wanting to have it, when it's actually not in the thing, that's cause for the lower realms, for rebirth as a praetor. So there's a big incentive in there. Anyway, so every year I give away maybe a couple of things. <laughs> it's so bad. I'm so bad at it. Uh, and then even if I regret it later on, oh, I shouldn't have, then I think, no, no, this is my practice. My practice is to try and develop the perfection of generosity. You've got to do it on the things where it's hard. And even if later on you have a regret about it, just that's just a reactive emotion. It doesn't mean anything. You're not actually regretting it. Actually, you're really pleased that you, you were able to win that one. <laughs> you were able to conquer that one. And it's just residual attachment. It's just residual regret. Forget about it. Don't regret those things. Regretting that you've given something away is even worse than not giving it away, in fact because we're like we're regretting our virtue so we need lots of practice so we've got this little meditation about giving our body as the four elements because in the end we're going to have to give our body away as well so we can start practicing now and it doesn't have to be this fear of dying it can be real joyous sharing so this is from a meditation from Lama Zoe from Boucher from a book uh, called Wholesome Fear. And I, I love this meditation because it, it puts a new slant on giving things away uh, as a joyous thing <laughs> rather than a hoarding thing. So let's give it a go in the few minutes we have left. So just, again, adjust your posture. So maybe sitting up a little bit more straight, but still being comfortable, feeling quite well grounded but also alert so if you're a bit tired sometimes if you put your hands in your lap and your elbows a bit out from the torso they say like the wings of a bird about to take flight so you're you're ready to do the meditation 
and feel embodied there on your seat. Become aware of the breathing. Feel the how the seat supports you, how you're, you're grounded and feel the weight of your body and feel how your flesh and blood and bones, how they have a physical weight to them and feel that that weightiness and solidity is actually part of the entire external earth element. So feel your body absorb into the external earth element and become like the stable earth itself. The earth used by all beings for survival. Feel that your body dissolves and becomes fields and crops, becomes beautiful parks, becomes roads and fantastic cars on those roads that don't make any pollution. Feel all of your organs become like the precious minerals and precious stones in the earth. Feel your two eyes become the sun and the moon, illuminating the world, illuminating the earth, four sentient beings guiding them. Feel that all of your flesh becomes food for everybody, especially the hungry. All the tastiness of your flesh absorbs into all of the food in the world, all the food in the supermarkets, becomes delicious cheesecakes and pizzas, macaroni. The blood in your body becomes delicious nectar, chai and champagne and smoothies all of the uh, the liquid in your body begins to absorb into the water element and that fluidity in your body and all of the fluids in your body they're not separate from the fluids in the world they're made of the same things so the fluidity absorbs into all the fluids in the world and becomes this nectar. Sparkly champagne, Coca-Cola, Fanta, vitamin drinks. It also becomes irrigation for all of the crops and becomes waterways for people to holiday on. And then all of the heat in your body, all of that energy and heat that's generated in your body, all of the, uh, the chemical reactions that produce energy in your body. This same process happens outside of your body as well. It's not separate. The heat in your body, it's just like the heat outside. So feel that your internal heat becomes one with the external heat and warmth in the world, it becomes the fire element. And your heat, the heat in your body is able to warm others, is able to bring warmth to all those who are freezing cold. It can be used for cooking, for creating delicious meals. It can be used for transportation. And it can be used to give light, to give safety. So feel that natural heat element in your body becoming one with the fire element throughout the world providing uh, that warmth, that energy.
And then notice the breath as you're breathing in and out. The air within your body, the air outside your body. It's still the air. This movement of the wind element within your body and outside your body. It's not separate. Feel there's this natural harmony between the wind element, that movement and spaciousness in your body and the wind element in the world. Feel how the natural wind element in your body, just like the air, the breath, you can give breath to those unable to breathe. Breath is life itself. It grants freedom and possibility. So feel that harmonious energy of the breath, of that movement and spaciousness in your body being breathed in by all living beings. They breathe in that life-giving force. They breathe in that harmony and that life-sustaining oxygen uh, flows into their bodies, sustaining every cell, And notice that spaciousness within your body on an atomic level, how we are mostly space, mostly energy, mostly possibility. Just a very fine percentage left over that becomes solid matter. That our body is made up of elements and atoms that are billions of years old that come from the very beginning of this universe. We're not separate from those elements and the spaciousness within each of our atoms is the same as the spaciousness all around us. that there is no separation between ourselves and others, even at an atomic level. So in this way, feel that your body composed of the four elements becomes like nectar to nourish and support all living beings, fulfilling their wishes, giving them ultimate happiness, everything they need. Food, drink, life-sustaining breath, light and guidance, and a solid, sustainable earth, the foundation. And feel that just by doing this meditation, You've been able to connect your elemental forces with the elemental forces all around us. No separation. And dedicate this meditation to being able to uh, use every element of your body for the benefit of sentient beings and to give your body to others. And recognize that there is no ultimate separation. And that we can give this uh, infinite potential and generosity. And so we can uh, dedicate this meditation that on a very deep instinctual level, 
we can enjoy giving our body as the four elements to all sentient beings and that by doing so we can benefit and benefit them in the very best possible way which is this dedication due to the merits of these virtuous actions may i quickly attain the state of a guru buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state may the supreme jewel bodhicitta not yet born arise and grow may that born have no decline but increase forevermore as long as space endures as long as sentient beings abide may i too remain to dispel the sorrows of the world so i hope you like that meditation i hope you um enjoyed doing it it's such a nice way to uh to connect <laughs> with others and to start really feeling like on a visceral level that we want to give our body away to <laughs> to let go of our body rather than be fearful about it it's it's such a nice way uh, to contemplate you know death and impermanence but from this really uh lust for life kind of approach <laughs> so we've covered quite a lot today i mean just diving in just just touching a little bit about attachment and how tricky it is the the misconceptions that that drive it underneath how this plays out in our day-to-day -day life that our whole life becomes like a tragic comedy so uh you know there that's probably the way in is to to have that kind of approach of of gallows humor a bit of tragic comedy a bit of com compassion uh to work with it so i really uh encourage you don't don't give up on your passion uh it's actually what we've got to do is make our passion count that's the thing from a mahayana sutra mahayana tantra point of view we need immense passion immense courage in a way immense attachment in terms of really striving for the big goal complete liberation and enlightenment for everybody and all of that if we can support it with wisdom then it's possible we can use everything then so um enjoy the enjoy doing the meditation every time you sit down and you you have dinner or something do a little bit of the meditation of offering your body and all the elements and the whole digestive process and the tastes and everything like that and uh next week we're going to look at uh particularly to do with dealing with anxiety because if we have anxiety the direct cause of anxiety is attachment <laughs> so uh we we mightn't be able to to make such obvious head road with attachment but just working on the anxiety end of things uh we'll be able to do something about it as well so yeah anxiety the result of attachment what on earth can we do about that and definitely there are things we can do so thanks for coming everybody have a great rest of the night rest of the morning <laughs> enjoy yes thank you miffy this is really great tonight that's thank that's a food you. for thought for attachment <laughs> thank you everybody thank you for meditation bye-bye thanks thank everyone thanks miffy Best wishes, everyone. Good night, everybody.